Our chairman, Casey, asked to be excused. He's out of town. Um, there are a few orders of business. One is that we need to uh, elect a new chair and vice chair, and uh, we don't have a body here today, so we do need to do that, and we need to get everyone else out. <laughs> Maybe we need to consider another time of day. Our new our new council member that's going to be repping the council on this committee is uh, Brent Sumner, uh, for your information. And uh, since the last meeting we had, uh, we had nine members on uh, as a part of the um, the code, and that was changed to seven. And each of you, I think, has responded and would like to continue on. Uh, Devin, you're still in your first term. Stan, you're in your second term, I believe, as far as you know, right? Well, as far as I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've got to talk to you sometime. Okay. Uh, would you like to continue on on the commission? That was one, one question that I asked of everybody. I don't know if I got a response. I email. Probably time for me to move on. Okay. Well, you've been you've been uh, pretty valiant. You've come to all of the meetings, so we appreciate you <laughs> doing that. Um, but we can talk after this meeting then. Um, we don't have a quorum, so we cannot we cannot consider the meeting minutes for approval. Welcome, Council Member Summer, to our meeting. Thank you. Let's go ahead and flip the order since our uh, presentation on the snow and ice control is is up and ready, and then we can do AMI at the end. Does that work for you, Tyler? Okay, so I'll turn the time over to Cody and to Bill. <coughs> Cody is our streets uh, section manager, and Bill is our field supervisor over uh, over streets, and he's also over the snow and ice control plan. So, Cody and Bill. Okay, it's okay, I'm just going to sit down here and go through it. Um, we're going to talk about the snow and ice control plan and how, how uh, Orem tackles uh, snow and ice. Um, <clears throat> first off, like uh, I said, I'm Cody, this is Bill. Uh, between the two of us, I think we've got pretty close to 60 years of experience with snow removal. Our whole group has probably around 200. Um, uh, we've been, I've been doing it since I think 94, feel about the same. 95, yeah. um, so, first off, Warren has got, four maintains about 500 lane miles of city owned roads. Um, that's, there's about 243 miles of center line miles, but if you split them into lanes, that's what we're talking about here is how many lanes. Um, including the medium, uh, the snow removal, snow and ice control plan is managed by our street section up here at Public Works. We're staffed with about 24 plow operators. That includes the, the guys that are uh, on the asphalt crew, the concrete crew, the stormwater crew. Um, it's all the street section. Uh, street section has about 15 plows, and they range from the big size 10 wheeler trucks to uh, the smaller maintainer what we call them, the small 4550s. Uh, during an average winter, Orem can receive about 35 to 40 inches of snowfall um, just throughout the whole season. We use, a, on average, about 2,000 to 2,500 tons of salt um, to treat the roads. And uh, by the direction of city council, and maybe not the current council, but in the past, Orem claims that it doesn't uh, follow a bare payment policy. And I'll talk more about that and why we don't uh, in another slide. The uh, purpose of having a snow and ice control plan, of, of course, is to um, ensure that safe travel routes are available during and after snow storm. Um, part of that is, part of our plan is to identify the arterials and the secondary streets that to serve uh, schools, hospitals, um, 
fire stations, things like that. Uh, so we got to have a plan in place to make sure that you know the, the streets are safe to travel, especially for emergency vehicles. And we do classify streets in the priority one, two, and three. And that shows. <coughs> Some of our service objectives that we have, uh, we try and help <laughs> make sure all the roads are open after a snowstorm within 24 hours. That that means when the storm stops, we're trying to get it all open to traffic within 24 hours. Doesn't mean we're going to have everything done, but we want to make sure that the, the traffic is open and safe. Safe. Um, some of the things we do is we make sure to divide our areas where one truck equipped with a, a plow and sander can service that area pretty efficiently and effectively. Uh, we divide our crews um, as well, just with with their experience and knowledge, and we try to keep them in the same areas so they can be more efficient in that area. But we do we do allow them to go to other areas so they can train. Um, and become familiar with multiple areas. So if we need the staff, we, need, we can. Um, Cody, can you describe how you determine when to call people in? And uh, I don't know, that's probably a part of your presentation, but I mean, it doesn't always snow during the day. It still sometimes right. snows at night, right? And right. Who's up checking the weather and letting the guys know when to do that? Yeah, when I they come in. That would be Bill. <laughs> you know, it's. I do have a slide on that. It's called it, we talk about weather monitoring, um, and I'll get to that. But generally, Bill's the one in charge of it right now. Um, he monitors it. I help monitor it. All the guys watch the weather, um, and, and they all they are all they're all pretty active about if they think something's going to happen about talking to one of us. Um, we have guys that live in town, a couple of them that are pretty active. So we, we rely on public safety a lot. Uh, for or calling us if they have issues, uh, if they have traffic right. problems, and so which weather weatherman's the most accurate? None of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably what, Pope Dan Pope, but I uh, I, I wouldn't <laughs> say any of them. Weather <laughs> Weather Rock John. <laughs> you know, I'll get into more of that. Okay. Too. I, I want to talk Sorry. more about that. One. That's all right. Um, so one of the Another thing we really rely on is training our staff, uh, make sure that they know what they're doing. And we all, always take in account the cost of what snow removal costs. Um, that's a big part of it, how much salt we're putting out, blades that we're using. Um, that's a big part of this. Talk a little bit about street priorities. Um, this is, this map here on the left kind of shows, um, well it does show how we rate our priority streets. Of course, what we call arterials are the ones that are in the red. Um, they're the number one uh, street that we try to get out to. Generally, we put our big trucks on that, the big 10-wheeler trucks. Um, we do have a few up in the northeast that are red, uh, and that's because of the steepness of the hill and the width of some of them roads. Um, we also have priority two, which are generally secondaries. It's the it's the collector streets that are taking traffic off the main arterials. Um, it also includes hills. Uh, hills become our, our big issue. So in reality, when our little trucks are out there, the blue becomes a priority one for our little trucks. Um, <clears throat> so they're them are generally the ones that get hit first. Uh, and then the priority three are pretty much the flat streets. Uh, the ones that we can leave for a while, um, cul-de-sacs, things like that. So like subdivisions are yeah. part of that yes. as well. Yes. <coughs> uh, I also want to talk about non-city streets. We get a lot of calls about um, non-city owned streets, which are, which are generally UDOT streets. Um, it is a responsibility, you know, you got private subdivisions, you got, you know, it's the res responsibility of the owners to take care of them streets, not the city. Um, I've listed here that 
UDOT are, are the main ones. You got UVU that's um, state owned, you got private developments. Uh, and then some of the streets here UDOT owns are State Street, 8th North, University Parkway, Geneva Road, and now we've just turned over 1600 Northwest Estate to them. And it's pretty interesting. You can go on their UDOT commuter link and see their plows out, and they, they've jumped right onto that 1600 North. So we was a little worried about transferring that street to them for that reason, but we're glad they have it. Some of the general practices, there's no, there's no firm recipe for snow. Every storm is different. Um, it's, it's amazing how one end of town can get a lot of snow and the other end sees nothing. Uh, you can have storms that'll come in from the southwest and you travel right to the northeast and you won't have anything in the northwest or anything in the southeast. It's just kind of through town. Um, so every time it snows, it's it's a different plan of attack. It's you got to analyze it. Bill has to go out there a lot of the time and see what's happening. We rely on our operators to tell us what's happening. Um, and there again, we re we heavily heavily rely on the the experience of the employees and operators that we have for this. Um, their experience in a variety of demanding situations is an essential ingredient ingredient to the effective road maintenance program. So. <coughs> um, put this slide up here to kind of show these are some examples because like no snow, no snowstorms the same. Um, sometimes we'll throw out seven to eight units, two ten wheel vehicles on a north south route on each side of State Street and then we put out five or six maintainers. It just depends on Depends on what roads are being affected. Sometimes because of the traffic that's on arterials, they're, they're, uh, the, heat of, the heat of the traffic will melt the snow a little faster and then the subdivisions are more impacted. Or you've got other plans here where we put out 11 to 12 units, have four 10 wheel deep uh, dump trucks assigned. Um, just different ways that we can do it. The last example there shows, you know, um, some of them snowstorms that that ended up being a lot of cleanup. Uh, a few years back, we had had a storm that iced up really quick on us. Um, it's hard to be effective when it freezes down to the ground, and then you spend days and days trying to clean it up. And where that says just maintainers only, it's it's hard to get them big ten wheel dump trucks in subdivisions, and generally that's just the cleanup. So there's, I guess. My point here is just to show that there's several different ways we can attack snow and ice control. This is a map that kind of shows, uh, this is pretty much our main main area. Uh, we've got different plans, but this is, what was this, this eight, eight area, seven area, eight area. Um, it shows each one of them squares that's colored different would be a route for um, one of our small trucks. Uh, the red lines, of course, are still on there. Them are them are uh, our ten wheel dump trucks taking care of them. But right there, that would be what a eleven truck route could be. Yeah. Um, so it's quite a bit of area for one truck to cover, but they do a pretty good job at it. Um, we tried to make it pretty equal on time. Where the northeast too is is basically one of our areas that is like always gets hit. Um, it takes him several times, or several hours, just to clean that smaller section because it's usually a lot deeper up there, a lot more work. Um, and when we do this, they once they get done in their area, they don't just stay in their area; they they jump to help other people. How long does it typically take to get through a, an entire area? Could we, uh, say Southwest One, if they were to push snow on. If the storm stops, I would say it's probably up to about four to six hours to get get it open up. That's why we give them twelve. Um, we don't like to run our guys, but well, we don't run our guys any longer than twelve hours. But we can generally get pretty quick.
This slide shows kind of a, I, ta I, I mentioned the bare pavement policy. Um, UDOT has a bare pavement policy, which means they're not happy. They, they run their salt all the time. They run their plows down all the time. We don't generally do that. Um, we found that, uh, especially in the subdivisions, that our main focuses are on hills and curves and intersections. What we, this is what we call spot salting. And so the operators train to basically turn their, their spreader on and off. So you can see them, the rectangle things down the road, them are, them are trying to represent where they put the switch on and put the switch back off. And, uh, what we find with that, and it, we've, we've done it for years, is um, the traffic actually tracks the salt. So as you, as you put down that salt, once the car tires go over it, it picks up the salt and tracks it to the other area. Um, <coughs> some of the smaller sanders are really hard to calibrate. They put out a lot of a lot of salt, and so we rely on this, especially with them, to to track that salt for us. The cars to track that salt for us, um, and, and that's our technique in subdivisions. Technology is changing uh, to where, especially in the big truck uh, equipment, to where they uh, are automated. Um, and we've been buying them. I think we have is it three of them now. They're automated, and then you can really calibrate and basically leave on all the time. So our arterials are are getting we're we're starting to do that more where the the spreader's on all the time. Um, to be clear here too, Cody, the blades are down. Yeah. This is where the salt is being applied on the curves and intersections yes. and hills. Yes. So your, your blade's down, clearing the, 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 the path, the salt comes behind, and this is the locations that they're, they're concentrating on. Um, it's basically anywhere a car would slip, right? So your stop sign where they'll slip through the stop sign, or they're going around a curve up a steep hill. We do classify um, storms. Um, we have A, B, C, and D. I'm just going to go through these. Class A storms, they're, they're minor intensity and handled with salt spreading units. So if you see a truck out there that doesn't have the plow down, um, it's because it's a smaller storm and we, we feel that we can just treat it with salt. It's just something that's a dusting. Uh, it's not the picture there on the right. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, it's generally less than two and a half inches. Uh, we, we train our operators to use their best judgment whether that plows down or not. Um, and Bill monitors that. We all monitor that. If it's not being effective with the, without the blades, then we'll have them put the blades down. Class B storms are basically greater than two and a half. Uh, they're greater intensity, and, and it basically means they're putting their plow down. Um, as mentioned earlier, we don't want to our guys any longer than a 12-hour shift. We feel it's unsafe, and, and generally we do less than that, just depending on the time of day. A lot of guys that get called out at 2 o'clock in the morning have only got two hours of sleep, two or three hours of sleep, and uh, safety is a big factor for us. We do say that it can take, now I mentioned we wanted to open up the traffic within 24 hours, but it doesn't mean all the work's done. But on this kind of storm, we, we hope to have everything done after the storm finishes in 36 hours or less. The Class C storm, uh, just bigger, five to eight inches. Um, this storm generally lasts longer than 24 hours. Uh, again, we do our 12 hour shifts and we just bump it to, to 48 hours. Um, These, these pictures, let me go back one, these pictures, just to let you know, are pictures that were taken when we got caught with the ice. Um, it, it come down so rapidly, we couldn't get on the streets fast enough. It, it froze to the ground, and we spent days and days trying to clean it up, and we had backhoes out, and backhoes, the plows following the backhoes, just trying to clear and open things up wider. I don't remember what year it was, but it was probably about five or six years ago. Class D, D storms are basically greater than eight inches. Uh, we plan to have 
plows in, spreaders out. Um, and in the extreme cases, we always have that opportunity to, to hire a contractor if needed, or you know we will recruit we will recruit guys from our water section. Um, they have some plows that they do parking lots and some of their wells and stuff with. Um, we get them out to help. We haven't had to hire a contractor since some of my first years in the early 90s. We hired some greater operators. Um, we feel like we were staffed pretty well that with the equipment and the, the personnel we had now to handle it all. Back then we had, I think, five, ten wheel trucks is all we had. Here's that weather monitoring. Talk about how we how we monitor the weather. Um, we use weather apps just like everybody on our phones. Uh, we look at them all the time. Um, we we learn to become uh, weather forecasters. <laughs> uh, there's nothing better than just looking outside and looking at the clouds and seeing what's happening. Um, NOAA is a good one that we use. Uh, I talked about social media there. Um, it's been kind of interesting last year, and I haven't seen one this year, but last year they, they put out some Facebook Lives from NOAA mm -hmm. that where you could get on and they would talk about the upcoming storm and you can get on and message them and say, well, what do you think Worm's gonna do? And they'll, they're dead on. Mm -hmm. When it comes to that, if you can get a, a forecast that way, <coughs> that's been pretty neat. I've used Twitter in the past to to uh, message Grant Wayman, and he's responded to me. Um, but yeah, them are the things that we use. We do have uh, Commuter Link is is one of the best apps for us because it's linked to the city traffic cameras. Mm -hmm. We can get on and, and go through the cameras and just kind of look at the roads and see what's happening. Um, we do have the traffic operations center upstairs, but it's it's kind of inconvenient to really go up there and try and manage. The operations you'd need a couple different managers to do that. Um, it's better to just get out in the truck and go see what's going on. We do have internal security cameras around public works and a lot of facilities, the wells. We put up a, a camera up the well up on Skyline that really helps us out up there that's pointed kind of at the well and right at the road. Um, it, uh, we, we utilize all of them, we've got access to them. And, Bill, Bill monitors them all the time. Uh, we wish there were more on the road so we can see that, that we're live. I talked about social media. Some of the triggers that happen is, is I put, Bill lives in Orem. Bill does live in Orem and it, it's, it's amazing. I managed it from 2005 to 2016 and I live in Saratoga Springs. And so it was very challenging for me to manage and I'd have to communicate with public safety a lot. And have to take a ride over to see what's happening. Bill lives in Orm, he can walk out his door and see what's going on and get in a truck and take a lap around the, around the city. And so he's been our main trigger right now. Um, we also have employees that live in Orm. We have one employee that lives up on 8th East and just north of Center Street that uh, is pretty helpful. He makes sure to text, text us if he sees things happening. Um, and again, all the, all the employees are watching the forecast and, and helping us. So, and then again, again public safety. Uh, when I was managing, I managing it, I relied heavily on public safety to call me. And we, we try and teach them that once it starts snowing, to give us a call. And just let us know that it's snowing. Um, they've been pretty good. Yeah, I definitely, I rely on them a lot from about 10 at night till 7 in the morning. That's good. You're still sleeping with one eye open. All right. I set my alarm. I get up at 4. <laughs> if they're predicting a storm, then I, I do. I get up at 4 and check the cameras. I talked about the equipment we use. Um, just so you can see what I'm talking about. The 10 little dump trucks right there is the main one that's on the arterial streets. And these two different classifications of maintainers. The, the one on the bottom, uh, of course, is a heavier duty truck than the one up on the right. Uh, it can hold a little bit more salt. But these are the subdivision trucks. Um, we really like this GMC in the, on the bottom. It'll turn on a dime, it'll, it'll 
it turns really well in a cul-de-sac. Uh, but them are the them are the vehicles. They're all those pictures, but them are the type of vehicles we're using. I'm going to put this picture up there just to show you some faces of our operators. Zoom <laughs> uh, in on that, Kind of put it in perspective, you know. We've got, we've got to all different kinds, have a lot of experience. <coughs> a few new guys that are, that are learning. Um, as I said earlier, I, I'll bet you we have over 200 years of experience with the crew we have. Um, there are several of us that have been doing it for 25 to 30 years. Like I said, some new guys that have just um, got a couple years in, but they're learning real quick and they do a really good job. So this was from Friday's storm. This was the crew that was some of the crew that was out Friday. I had Bill go out and take some pictures for this. So. Good housekeeping and training. I wanted to talk a little bit about this. This is this picture here on the left. Is our northeast area uh, it shows our retention pond there, our standard racks, and our salt building. Um, it's really important to us about uh, keeping the environment safe. And so we wash our sanders out there on that rack and the water flows right into the retention pond. So it's not just going into the ground. All of that is paved surface. So it flows right in there and then we just let this pond evaporate and then we clean it out. Um, the building, uh, when we moved in here to Public Works, we had that building built. The old building, we just left our salt out in a pile. We tried to create a berm around it. It's amazing how much salt you'll lose and uh, from the rain and just sitting there all the time. Uh, so this, this building is really nice for us. It holds approximately 3,000 ton of salt. Um, so the salt in the back of that building that came from the old Public Works still, we've never got into it. Um, the middle picture shows a, a training that we did um, and what they're doing is they're calibrating their sanders. And, um, we've, we've really got into this in the last few years. Uh, prior to that we didn't really calibrate, we just let the, the operators open up their gates and the smaller sanders don't have a speed on it, but the big sanders you can actually adjust the speed of the conveyor belt and the spinner. Um, and, and now we're getting some smaller sanders that do have the speed control. But what we're trying to do here is calibrate and we're, we're trying to get uh, at the low end about 200 pounds of salt per lane mile um, up to about 400. Um, and I, I've seen a big decrease on salt usage over the probably the last, what, five years um, because we're calibrating now. Uh, when we first started, we found out that we were probably putting out way too much, probably around a thousand pounds. It, it, I mean, the spreaders can put it out if you let them. So we're really, really big on this. What they're doing there is they're actually uh, dropping salt onto a tarp. They weigh it um, and they count how many rotations the spinner goes and how many rotations that the conveyor belt goes, and they do the math and can calibrate it. Um, some of the bigger trucks, like I said, are automated. We check the calibration on them. They have dials in them that they can say how many pounds per lane mile they put out. Um, but yeah, we're finding 200 pounds on a smaller storm is about right. Big storm about double that, 400. Just a curious question. Yeah. Where does the salt typically come from? The salt that we buy, you see it's red. It comes from Redmond, Utah. It's the mine salt. Mm -hmm. There's uh, been a lot of studies on what kind of salts used. You've got the white salt coming out of the Great Salt Lake. Um, we we <coughs> really like this, I can't remember, it's Class D road salt, I believe. Um, because what, what happens is the salt from the mine is not all salt. It's got other things in it. And so it applies to the grit. It's mm -hmm. just basically dirt. Rock, and so it applies a grit at the same time. Is it easier than salt on the roads? Uh, Not as wear and tear salt. I know it digs up the roads. Yeah, it's. I I, I don't know that it's much different okay. that way, but um, this salt also works to a lower temperature, mm -hmm. than, uh, and and we think it's more of because they can crush it. So the salt out of the Great Salt Lake, they basically put it in drying ponds and it crystallizes, and you get one standard size salt. Right, you get in your 
and your little bags that you buy at the grocery store, they're all about the same size. That's just a natural crystallization of the salt. So they, they dry it out, they scrape it up, and put it into a pile and sell it. For this, they're digging into a, a big mine, and it's coming out in big chunks, and they have to put it through a crusher. And so they get smaller gradations, which works faster and quicker when it's smaller. Um, that's part of it, plus it, it also um, put some grit down the road. Back back in the 90s, we were mixing sand and salt, about 50-50. Mm -hmm. um, there's still places that do that. They, they, there's still places like mountain passes that they'll just put sand down, and it's just to get grit. But that causes a lot of problems for us for storm drain reasons. Um, it plugs storm drains. It also creates um, air pollution, PM10s. So as the traffic's running over, it'll create dust particles in the air, and so we've, we've got away from that to just straight salt. Does that make sense? Yep, okay. absolutely, thanks. Yeah. Um, talk about the future of Warham, uh, where, where we're headed. You can see the picture on the top left. That's a picture of one of our newer spreaders, and it's got tanks on it. So uh, we've done an experiment over the last couple of years uh, with Lehigh's help. They've provided some salt brine for us. Um, and that's what the tanks hold is some brine. And what happens is, is when you have brine in there, you have sprayers that are down in the, the, the chute there where it's gonna come out of the truck. They spray <coughs> the salt with, with the brine solution, which is just salt water. And what it does is it activates that salt hmm. immediately. So, you think about it when you put salt on the ground what's what's going to happen it has to sit there and start to absorb water and create the solution on the ground to start melting the ice so it takes some time but if we if we start spraying brine on it immediately okay. it activates quicker it starts melting quicker and so in the budget last year we put in we requested some money to build a building and this is a picture of Lehigh stuff uh, we're going to build a building out by our salt dome that's specifically designed to make brine and it'll have a brine maker like that picture there on the right. So what that does is an automated brine maker, you put a load of, and we use white salt in this, you put a load of salt in it, set it, and it'll, it'll create a brine solution. And it's really tricky because there's a, a key solution, it's like 23.3% solution um, to make the brine. If you get it less than that, your roads will freeze. If you get it higher than that, your roads will freeze, so you got to be really, it's really critical to get it right. So we're really looking forward to having our own building, our own brine maker, and we'll have some storage tanks like that to store it. Uh, and what we're doing is we've been replacing our salt spreaders with ones with tanks as, as we're rotating them through. How many do we have now, Bill? We have six. Six, six out of our 15 that are equipped with tanks. Uh, we'll be getting three more here soon I, with, with the replacement. Uh, the picture on the bottom right is just what they call, um, help me get this right, it was, it was anti-icing. So there's a different, There's you'll hear pre-wetting and you'll think that it's the picture there on the right. The pre-wetting is what I talked about where they pre-wet the salt. The truck that's spraying like this, you've probably seen UDOT do it. They do it all the time. They put the tanker down the, the freeway and they spray the road with that. That's a brine solution. And that's called anti-icing. So what it's doing is uh, it's got jet nozzles that spray straight down or drill nozzles that spray straight down and uh, put brine on the road. And that, what it does, it'll dry and it'll kind of put a salt film on the road and they call it anti-icing, so when the snow falls, what it's doing is it's not letting it bond to the road. So it's breaking that bond before it ever even happens. And that allows several hours before to get out on it with the regular spreading units. It'll start melting and right off the bat. Um, so we're looking forward to getting into that down the road as we put this brine thing into place. Um, there's other things out there uh, in, in the back east, they, they use all sorts of things. They use beet juice. Um, they use mag chloride, which is uh, pretty costly, and it's just another type of solutions. You can, they do blends and different things, but 
here out here west where they're finding that brine is, is the number one the cheapest solution and the number one thing to use out here it uh, they claim it'll cut costs of salt usage by about 30 percent so it's quite and we've seen that we we with our experimentation over the last couple of years we've seen less salt use because we're spraying our salt with brine you can put a ton of salt and make hundreds of gallons of brine wow. so we actually weren't able to get brine this year and the operators have told me how much they miss it okay mm -hmm. huh. so the co the total cost would be a little less you think because you still that you're 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 augmenting your supplanting that with this solution so there's a cost there maybe a reduction in your salt but an increase in cost here with the the solution that you're putting down the solution is pretty cheap to make yeah but yeah I think it, it <coughs> overall I think we'll spend less um, what do you know 11 cents a gallon isn't that what they mm -hmm. think it's a beehive with them to cost them to make about 11 cents a gallon with the there's there's a certain there's there is a cost decrease but even more important is the increase in safety yeah. where we'll Good service level. basically that makes so much sense. getting the, uh, the roads that. clearer faster um, which is one of the reasons uh, the primary reason I think that, that we recommend it go <coughs> uh, to the brine solution what's nice is the, when we get to that point with the tanker we can we can attack streets like Center Street Hill off of the freeway. Mm -hmm. We could pre-treat that. Uh, we could pre-treat Skyline. We could pre-treat pre a lot of stuff prior to going home. One of the biggest fears for us is our guys leave at 5.30, and sometimes them snowstorms come in at 6 and 6.30, and they're on their way home and have to come back, and it's just... But if we were to spend a couple hours at the end of the day to pre-treat or anti-ice, we don't even get it wrong. But, uh, pre treats also. Yeah, free treat, free treat the road. So, we what, really what's been the that. response from Lehigh? You know, and and their community have they? Has I it, don't has know how their community is reacting. Their their snow removal group just loves it. They they brag it up. We, me and Bill have gone to. Uh, we went back to Indianapolis and and attended a snow conference back there, and it was big back there. Um, that they had classes on it. It's just big thing the one that they had here last year they had the conference here last year they talked a lot about Brian it's it's just the way everything's going it's it's environmentally better so you're using less salt there's just a lot of goodness to it but yeah I don't know how Lehigh has taken it so. uh, I put this up here these are some of the <laughs> Main questions that we get all the time. Um, they're challenging to answer sometimes. Uh, why wasn't my street plowed? A lot of the time it's because it's not a city owned street or it's because it's a cul de sac. It looks like that up on the right. I mean, try and take a big truck down that road and turn it around. It's very challenging. Um, why do plows push? always push snow in my driveway? I'll talk a little bit more about that one here. I think it's the next slide. Uh, you know, the sidewalks are an issue. Um, it's supposed to be the residents or the property owners to clear their sidewalks. Um, just, yeah, some general questions. Them are, them are the main ones. We always make sure that, you know, if we have an emergency, you know, the dispatch can let us know and we, we'll run right over there. We generally have somebody in the area anyways. I did put the city ordinance up there that pertains to snow re removal. There's not a lot there. Uh, basically talks about obstructing streets and sidewalks. Um, that's part of it. The clearing of sidewalks, the owners, occupants, tenants are responsible to keep it clear of not only snow and ice, but debris, dirt, rocks. <coughs> um, we don't have any policy on how soon the sidewalks um, need to be cleared or any ordinance that says that you know it's probably time for us to start looking at the ordinances a little closer and see if there's something we can do but some of the problems that we do have is is some of these contractors that will plow out business parking areas and plow it right onto the street um, that's a challenge for us but 
I just want you guys to see that. Um, do you, do you uh, the HOA living area, do you plow those? No. That's no, them. That's them. I put this up, I talked about clearing the, or why does the plow always push snow into my driveway? This is kind of what we try to teach as people call in. It's not a perfect solution, but if the residents can shovel their driveway and think about the plow that's going to come down the road, if they'll shovel, you know, uh, before the plow hits, it'll give them more room to place that snow. Just kind of explain. So if you, if you shovel this 10 to 15 feet, as the plow's coming this way, it's going to hit this and it's going to put the snow right here and the driveway will be clear. Wow, so, that's pretty good. Yeah, like I said, it's not a perfect really solution, but it's something that we can try and educate the, the residents on um, to kind of help with that. Um, again, they're they're responsible for doing their driveways and entrances and access to mailboxes. Um, and you know, they need to place the snow on private property. We, we see a lot of residents that will take their snow blower out there and blow it right out in the middle the center of the road. We try, if we have time, we'll stop and say, hey, do you think you can turn that around and just put it on your lawn? It's good for your lawn. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so challenges like that all over the place. We get a lot of residents that will try to help us out with four-wheelers and things like that. They'll make piles right in the middle of the cul-de-sac as high as they can. Do this just so they can get around. <coughs> just challenges all over. Some things that how farm residents can help. They always park their vehicle off the street. Uh, we know that's a challenge. Orm was built in the seventies, and there's not a lot of parking for people. Um, and I think that's why the council hasn't wanted to do a no parking thing. There's a lot of cities like out of Saratoga Springs that we can get a ticket if we leave our car out during a snowstorm. Um, but if we can educate and, and teach them to try and use their driveways as much as possible. Uh, I had a resident one time that, I, that got mad at me when I was out plowing and, and uh, he was mad that I, we didn't plow right up to the sidewalk in front of his house and, and when I stopped and talked to him he he, he said well, where am I supposed to park but his driveway was full of trailers and all sorts of other things and and uh, you know we just can't clear to the sidewalk for everybody and so it becomes a challenge um, travel at a safe distance from the snow plows we have a lot of people that try and outrun us and come around us on the, even on the right They'll come around that side of us um, just be patient if you're behind the equipment because they're just trying to clear the path. Uh, drive at reasonable speed. Um, don't let your children play near near a snow berm. Does everybody know what a snow berm is? They pile that snow up and uh, it gets pretty scary when you see kids tunneling in that because we've got a great big plow coming down the street and we don't know if, if kids are in there. Um, just drive with caution, uh, limit your travel, um, don't stop a snow vehicle or obstruct its path, and then if you can help your neighbors, the shoveling, we get a lot of questions about sidewalks, shoveling the sidewalks, and a lot of people think that's our responsibility to do, we don't have the, the time or <coughs> manpower to do that. How many miles of sidewalks do we have? Uh, well, we have 243 centerline miles, and you double that with sidewalks or curb and gutter. So somewhere in that area, um, a lot of sidewalks. Uh, a lot of the obstructions are in cul-de-sacs or basketball hoops, trash cans, toys. We had a <laughs> one of our plows try to turn around in a cul-de-sac, and he headed down the road, and I think it was me that caught him. He didn't get too far, but he had the top of the sander caught a basketball hoop. And oh, oh my it. gosh. Yeah. And so, <coughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and then buckle up for safety. And last slide here. Just enjoy it. Arms of Winter Wonderland. Yeah. So, if we have any questions? Very nice. Or, Very thorough. Yes. Yeah. Um, it sounds like overall 
things are running pretty well. And as a resident of Warham, I agree. Everything seems to run pretty well. So thank you very much and thank you for this presentation. Um, one question I had was, it, it's been kind of a hot topic lately at the city council on how the pay is affecting some of these four first responders and other you know, core infrastructure. You said that your goal is to have um, you know, these drivers who are trained in how to work the machinery and cross-trained in maybe some of the stuff that they don't normally work in. Do you feel like with the team that you have that that's happening well? Are we like having some people lose out due to pay and go to different cities? <coughs> what would your kind of feelings be? Our section, we've, we've been able to maintain our group uh, for the most part. Um, pay is always an, an issue. Uh, you're seeing a, a different generation come in where um, back, back 10, 15 years ago, guys were more, how do I say this, Bill? More, uh, I'll use the word responsible, I guess. I don't know what else to <laughs> use, but but they were very active. The guys now that are coming in are more, you know, they like their time off. They, they want more pay. Um, it gets challenging that way, so we're trying to be creative and finding ways to keep them They're happy. Not as invested Last in year jobs. we I went through with Chris and Reed and and we implemented a, an on call which we didn't have before. We were just relying on guys to be home whenever because that was part of their job. Uh, now we're actually placing guys on call um, not per week but per storm. So as a storm comes in we we, uh, we go up, up the ladder and and tell Reed and Chris that we need guys on call and we'll place a group of guys on call so they're getting compensated that way. Uh, Are most workers hourly or salary? Uh, hourly. I, I think our whole group's hourly. Okay. Snow so, removal people would have to be. Yeah, um, and it's helped. Uh, it, it's, it's really helped by giving them a little bit of compensation and, and you know, we, we find little things with the training and giving them opportunities to lead and that kind of stuff works. So okay. we've been able to retain it. Okay. How big is your team, your direct team? Our, our team is, our street section is made up of streets and stormwater. Um, there's 25 including me, but I say there's 24 operators. So there's there's about, what is it, 13 in streets and 11 yeah. or 12, 12 yeah. in stormwater. Yeah, I, yeah, 13 is me, so 12 and 12 is what it is. Okay. Uh, we do utilize not only the crew guys, but we have our, our SWIP inspector as a driver, our GIS guys are trained to drive, um, long-term SWIP guys, uh, part of it, so we utilize everybody we can. Uh, <coughs> we do help, have some uh, water guys that help us out occasionally if we get shorthanded. But if you train Chris, uh, he's been out with us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, down this year. I was out with Mike Johnson. In fact, <clears throat> I was out driving around just to see how everyone was doing, and I ran into Mike who was plowing or pushing, and so I ch I followed him for like a half a mile, and he was kind of getting irritated. He didn't know who it was. <laughs> and then he kind of pulled over, and I was like, hey, Mike, <laughs> come swing by my house, and I'll drop off, because he was in my neighborhood. And so he swung by, and then I went with him for the rest of the day. <laughs> and uh, it's it was great to give out with them and see how challenging it is oh, and, uh, and, and how sensitive they are to getting these areas and sanded properly or, or salted properly at key intersections and on on hills and grades. We were in Middle Earth is the area that they call it. I don't know why it was named that, but that's where I, I guess I was. We found when we took over, when I took over the plan, the one area that all the trucks at the end of shift would congregate was uh, the east side in the middle of town. And I think the Hobbit and all that was popular at the time. We said, let's call that Middle Earth. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Cody, I got two more quick questions for you. Um, that map that you have that shows the priorities, is that published? Yes. Okay. Yes. You can find you can find pretty much this report, which is all this stuff come from yeah. this one, 
and the map on the website. Okay. I was looking for it recently. I didn't yeah, see it's it. It's under but. the streets. If you go to Public Works and the streets, you'll find that report. Okay. And then the last question, um, do we have any monitoring for, like, residents that alert for snow that can feed towards um, Bill? Is that yeah. right? Uh, no, okay. not at the moment we don't. I mean, it would be nice if, like, the Orem chat that they're trying to get everyone onto, if that can be when it mentions snow or something like that, then those can start, oh, we get four of them here. We better send a real alert to Bill, even though it's three in the morning. But that's not you. <laughs> if you're up, if you're up watching the snow at three in the morning, good for a shit. I'm sure that if that was available, people idea. would use it. Yeah, I, I, I think so. All right, thank you. Bill, can you tell us, you, you know, when you see a storm coming, uh, Mr. Pope says, hey, it's coming, and you're like, eh, I don't know, Noah doesn't say it's, it's coming at <laughs> yeah, that time or whatever. Yeah. I mean, can you that's tell us, true. like, if you go to you go home at night and then you're like, it's coming, I know it's coming, What tell us what goes through your mind and what you do. <laughs> it's like, oh, great, uh, yeah. I'll sleep. I just, I watch the, I look at the apps, I watch every news channel there is to see what each of them are saying. Yeah. And just keep looking at the cameras. The radar. If it got yeah, radar, looking at that, and then if it gets around 11, 10, 11, and it hasn't come in yet, then I go to bed and hope the dispatch calls. But I always set my alarm at 4 because if they haven't called by then, I want to know if there's snow on the ground so I can get a group out there before uh, traffic. Sounds great. One of the hardest things they, they have with predicting is that off the Great Salt Lake, the, the lake effect. Oh, the lake yeah. effect, yeah. That is, that is a challenge, and sometimes them storms that come from the, the northwest head right for Orem, you know, and it, it, it pick it up off that lake, and you know, we won't even be expecting it, or we'll be. <laughs> they haven't been pretty good at predicting this year, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but we've had guys ready, um, training, and it's been good that way. Should point Thank out you, that Cody. Yet the holiday yesterday was the first holiday that we didn't have snow. This is snow. Nice. <laughs> 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 so we're three for four. <laughs> New Year's Day, we had guys at every single one of those. Christmas Eve, Christmas, Christmas Day, Thanksgiving, <laughs> Thanksgiving yeah. Day. Uh, yeah, and then New Year's, we had them out. New so, Year's morning, 7 o'clock. Yeah. Thank you. Very interesting. Well, I might say on the water side, we love this place. <laughs> yeah. Of course you, yeah, just mount, store it. Okay. I do too. Do we need? Could you approve minutes? Because I wasn't here. We don't. We don't, have we don't do quorum, it anymore. So. Yes. Yeah. We don't have, well, we yeah. don't have a quorum to. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So next meeting, maybe we'll have a quorum to approve the minutes from a year five ago. Five years. <laughs> Thank you. I, I will send out an email to everybody okay. here uh, regarding uh, applying, reapplying. <laughs> Devin, you're, you're off the hook because you're new. But uh, in terms of reapplying, we need to officially reappoint again. Okay. I think we did that last You did that. said something last Well, week. I, I did, but I, oh. what ha needs to happen is you'll need to go out there and actually fill out the form. On the website? On the website. Okay. And I'll send you all a link to that as okay. well. We do have, uh, this year we, we purchased some uh, water bottles, containers, with our logo on it and nice. so forth, and we want to we want to get all of you one of those. Yes. And so I'm going to ask April if she'll coordinate with all of you and make you aware of what we have, so you can pick. We have a variety of colors and selections, okay. so forth. We're going to make those also available. I'll give those to the council members as well. Um, and I just want to let you know also that the mat we've been asked to do an update on the master plans, so we're going to be starting that here shortly which will also include an update on the financial models to include bonding. Our, uh, our master plan and our financial plans did not include any bonding. Mm. I, I should say that we did include options, um, but we do have an interest, I think, right now. And uh, Council Member Sumber, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a, more of an interest now to maybe evaluate <coughs> bonding and how that could uh, keep our rates low yeah. as a result. The, the pay, pay as you go is a, is a good philosophy, but it, if you can, right? If you can, yeah. But yeah, we're looking at possibly bonding some money. So that'll be coming soon. And then uh, April, regarding our minutes, all of our minutes are, are now going to be uploaded in a YouTube format. Oh, okay. So you'll be able oh. to view that, and there will be links to different segments 
of the uh, of the agenda, so you can nice. you can skip to a, uh, using a hyperlink to different areas on that. Okay. So there will be no uh, there'll be no more paper copies or actual minutes uh, that like you traditionally have seen. So we can see your presentation. Minutes. So okay. Okay. Now, so thank you. Yeah. That's fine. Have fun out there. Thanks for taking such good care of our work.